welcome to another episode of This Week in Hearing. Hi, I'm Bob Trainer, your host for this week's episode. And I have a really interesting discussion this week with a couple of colleagues that are building a very unique device. Um, the device is called Santro, and you may have seen this in a uh, announcement uh, by Carl Strom in Hearing Review uh, a few weeks ago. These guys are actually the, the winner of an honorable mention award uh, from the annual Hearing Health and Technology Awards. Uh, now there, there we have like 15,000 people voting and these guys came very close to winning from what I understand. They're also the winner of Big Innovation Award uh, for 2022 offered by the Business Intelligence Group. You know, they're one of 81 brand new products across the whole globe uh, for innovation and so on. These are judged by execs and uh, leaders across the world. Uh, so it's my pleasure today to introduce to you uh, Anthony Florick, who's the president of Soundwave Hearing and his colleague, Christopher Bolvin, who is the chief technology officer for Soundwave. Again, this is just a unique device that we thought was really worth uh, the time and energy for our colleagues to at least think about uh, as an OTC product in their clinics. So let's begin with, uh, with Tony. Welcome guys to uh, This Week in Hearing. And, uh, and Tony, can you give us a little bit of an idea of how you came to the industry and an orientation to uh, sound wave hearing? You bet. Thanks, Bob. Uh, thanks to also Hearing Health and Technology and This Week in Hearing. It's exciting to be here and Soundwave's honored to uh, be uh, in a discussion with you all this week. So I'll give you uh, 30 years in less than three minutes. So I, I've been in medical devices for about that 30 plus years. First half of that uh, was in ophthalmology with cataract implants and phaco emulsification equipment and LASIK equipment. And I often joke with people that I'm, I'm working my way down the body and I got into to hearing. Um, I, I spent about 11 years with, with Beltone as their VP of sales and training and worked with the managed care departments and business development, sales administration, um, the, the dealer network and the um, certainly their corporate stores. And af after that, I, I uh, ventured out on my own and um, uh, ventured into a, uh, a technology uh, incubator called Matter in Chicago and uh, met uh, Chris Bovin, uh, who was working for a company called Resonance Medical. And uh, he was developing a uh, hearing test uh, for uh, on an app and they didn't have a, a hardware yet and OTC was bubbling. This was... Uh, before it was signed into law in 2017. Um, and I spent about a year and a half uh, helping them commercialize the, the software, uh, looking for hardware partners, and eventually went out on my own in 2018 and uh, started Soundwave Hearing. Uh, my first uh, partner, Joe, um, is uh, the brains behind all, all the hardware. And, and then Joe and I turned around and bought Resonance Medical and the, the app and the software and the patents and all the technology. And uh, Chris became our third partner, and that's that's the foundation for uh, Soundwave Hearing. And we just commercially launched our product, the Santro Hearing Aid Model AI, uh, this past January. Great. So, so Chris, uh, what's your story? I, I know that you studied with some of the famous audiology researchers in our field, such as and particularly John Allen at the University of Illinois. But tell us a little bit about your journey into into the into the physics and so on and software and all the things that go into a a, a innovative kind of product. Yeah, uh, well, thanks, Bob, for having us on. Um, yeah, I got my uh, start with hearing about ten years ago, uh, doing a PhD at the University of Illinois, um, trying to analyze the signals in the auditory system, uh, and so I was presenting some research um, from, that, uh, from that time in 2016 
I met a team of people in San Diego at this conference and they were building a product to optimize cochlear implants uh, at home so patients wouldn't necessarily have to go to the audiology clinic to improve how those cochlear implants sound. So I ended up joining that team. Uh, we pivoted pretty quickly to hearing aids just because there was a much larger commercial opportunity there. Um, and as Tony said, eventually that turned into Soundwave Hearing. And here we are uh, building our own hearing aids, developing the software, which allows uh, users to optimize their devices in the comfort of their own home. My understanding is that, uh, that the Central device uses a unique kind of uh, uh, AI and machine learning, as well as uh, some, some techniques that are involved in, in the uh, hearing evaluation component. Maybe Chris, you can kind of help us a little bit with understand that uh, better. Um, yeah, uh, sure. Uh, Bob, you were an audiologist, so I'm sure you've administered many an audiogram. Uh, so audiograms work by playing pure tones to the patient. By somewhere around 50,000 of them. Uh, or <laughs> yeah, friends. just 50,000, right? Just like many of my colleagues that do this every day. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, so with a, with a conventional audiogram, you know, you play pure tones to the patient. The patient indicates whether they heard the response or not. Uh, you go through half a dozen frequencies or so, one at a time on the left and right ear, you go up and down in intensity to sort of uh, zero in on that threshold for that given frequency. Uh, so our approach is similar in the sense that we play pure tones to the user. The user indicates whether they heard the tone or not, uh, but we use probability theory to decide which tones to play. And the way that we do that is we recognize that pure tones exist on a two-dimensional space of intensity and frequency, uh, same as an audiogram. So what we do is we compute a special function over the space that represents our uncertainty about any possible tone we could play given the previous responses of the user. So our algorithm recommends a tone to play that we're most uncertain about, or equivalently, uh, the tone that will provide us the most information. We play that tone, we get the response from the user. That's a new data point. We recompute this uncertainty estimate, and then we get a new recommendation for which tone to play. And we do this over and over iteratively until in a similar way, we can zero in on the hearing threshold curve. Uh, and because we're doing this in a statistically rigorous way, uh, an optimized way, uh, we're able to get a result in uh, about three minutes versus five to 10 minutes for an audiogram. Uh, in addition, uh, our estimate is a nice continuous uh, estimate of the threshold rather than just uh, the discrete points that you get with the audiogram. So that's, that's basically how the algorithm works. And then this is a in situ test. So that just means that we're using the hearing aids themselves to play the tones and administer the test. And it's, uh, they're talking with the app, which is, it contains all the intelligence that I just described. Now I understand too that, that, um, that the, the evaluation itself has some pretty good test retest kind of reliability uh, uh, relative. In other words, the test I do at the clinic, uh, how close is that to the test that you guys might do to mm -hmm. facilitate uh, the, uh, the use of the device. Right, yeah, we were uh, very interested in that, that question as well. So that's why we did an experiment at Northwestern University in their audiology clinic. Uh, we had uh, patients take a conventional um, hearing test in a sound booth with an audiologist um, and compare uh, those results with our in situ self-guided hearing test. And we found that the average difference between the thresholds uh, was only a few dB. Uh, so we think this really indicates that uh, using this method uh, to program the amplification of our devices will give us a, a decent first fit. Well, I, I think that, and, and all of us know from, from all of our lives in audiology that the test retest reliability is like 5 dB. My understanding yep. is yours is even just a little better than that from what, uh, from what we were talking about the other day. Yeah, that, that wasn't a part of the, the study, but we have tested that internally. And yes, our, our test retest reliability 
is absolutely comparable to what you get uh, with a conventional audiogram. So, so if so, how do uh, do patients actually go through the fitting process and and that kind of thing in in terms of your particular system? Well, so we we get the threshold curve, which again is just the same as an audiogram, and then um, we use a prescriptive fitting equation uh, then to adjust the uh, compressive gain parameters of our of our hearing aid. So we do it in the same way as an audiologist. Well, and 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 the, the other question I would have for you too, Chris, is you know, um, everybody and their and their brother and their mother and their brother-in-law and so on are all talking about AI. Um, mm -hmm. What really is kind of the AI uh, uh, concept and how have you incorporated it into the processor and into the into the fitting parameters and those kinds of things? Mm -hmm. uh, what, what I just described uh, earlier about the this uncertainty estimate and using probability theory that really is uh, the machine learning I was talking about. Um, machine learning is is sort of just a buzzword. Um, really, what it is is just statistics. So um, that's how we're using machine learning to to improve. Um, how we get this hearing threshold curve. Um, but I, I would say that, you know, it takes a fair bit of computation to do these things. And one of our major accomplishments was getting that to run on a mobile processor. Uh, so we had have to use highly optimized math libraries that can do things like linear algebra in, a, in an efficient way um, on, on your device. Because in between each trial, each presentation of the, of the tone, we have to make a decision, right? What's the next one we should play? And that has to be done in a fraction of a second. Uh, so again, uh, that's something that, uh, where the intelligence is really all uh, made possible because we all, we all have smartphones now. We have this pretty powerful computer in our pocket. And so, uh, well, I'm glad there's somebody who can compute all that linear algebra <laughs> and all those uh, fancy kinds of calculus things and so on that are necessary uh, rather than having me do it or some one of my colleagues do it. Most of us know the decibel and we know physics and we know some of those things, but but the, some of the calculations uh, escape us to some degree. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so, so uh, uh, Tony, as, as, as you guys looked at the marketing and so on for this device, did, um, was, was there some sort of rationale that went into having it a self-fitting uh, instrument rather than just something that was a one-size-fits-all as many of the OTC products are? Yeah, but part of our, our goal at Soundwave is to partner with the audiology community. And we thought this was a really effective way to do that, efficient way for the patient. Um, you know, we're, we're sort of positioning ourselves as a starter hearing aid. And I know from uh, previous experience uh, running groups of providers that if, if 10 people uh, walk into uh, a hearing aid provider's storefront, uh, 40% of the time, on average, nationally, they walk out with nothing. So that that tested, not treated patient is not doesn't make the business model for the provider very efficient. It makes it very inefficient. So part of our, our thesis is, hey, can we capture those tested, not treated patients? Because um, I think every provider knows if they leave the office, they don't come back. They go down the street, they go online, they go to Costco, or they do nothing. And that's that's what we're trying to capture, and that's that's why we want to partner with the audiology community as a starter hearing aid, and that's the opportunity I saw with the software, with the self-fitting technology. Um, we had to come up with uh, a piece of hardware that was worthy of the audiology community and certainly to the to the patient. And I think we did that, and um, we partnered, uh, put them both those technologies together come up with a, a robust solution for those providers. Yeah, I've always been uh, a huge advocate for, for practice differentiation. And practice differentiation is kind of where the ball game is these days. Um, how different your practice can be from another practice up the street. And the more, more levels of product that you can carry in your clinic and the, and the more innovative each of those can be, the, uh, the, the better 
your uh, success will be in any particular market, I would think. Uh, and and so. Um, yeah, and, and, and we, we agree with that. And the, yeah. I, I often joke that I'm, I'm the dumbest guy in the room, but I, I listen to all these providers and these folks in the audiology community. And I think that the innovative ones, the ones that, that are on the, the, the early part of the curve are seeing OTC and all the changing regulations as an opportunity. They're no longer threatened by it. This, this is a, a big bucket of lead generation. And I, I think if and when, and more when, they, they learn how to embrace it and change their business model slightly, um, this will be a boon for the penetration of all those folks that have a mild to uh, moderate hearing loss, but don't seek hearing, you know, don't seek amplification for whatever reason. Is, is it the stigma still? Is it the pricing still? You know, what is it? But I, I see more and more audiologists actually selling online and getting on, on their own website, getting into this digital marketplace and attracting more patients, becoming the local experts in their community. And whether they sell a central hearing aid through that e-commerce uh, idea, or they sell a hearable, or you know, it's it's they're but they're they're attracting a or a hearing protection device. They're they're attracting a patient um, to to their practice, and they're they're getting them into their ecosystem. They're getting into their through in that patient into their purview of care, and eventually, you know, they'll when they fall outside of the moderate to mild indication, they'll sell them a prescription hearing aid. And, and if their care is good, and most are, they'll sell them a third and a fourth set. And that's that's the long-term value of OTC as lead gen, as part of this, you know, getting in this e-commerce mix and just fortifying their bottom line so they can take care of more patients. No, I, I totally agree. Uh, I've been an advocate of OTC for way over 20 years now because uh, uh of the of the benefits i think that it will offer versus the limitations and so on so so there are lots of reasons why this would be now if we just shift gears here for a moment or so tony what uh, uh how how would um what do you guys think the difference between the there's a lot of otc uh or i guess more than otc there more of more dtc direct to consumer products that are out in the marketplace currently. And, uh, and how, how do you see uh, Santro kind of working um, within that DTC market? Right, it's, uh, it's sort of a, a Tony Chris question, but I'll sort of set the stage. A Tony I mean, Chris question, well, great. Yeah, uh, <laughs> or, or, yeah. or Tony Chris, the answer. Or Chris yeah. Tony question, maybe, who knows? Uh, yeah. Right, but I mean, it, it's it's a little confusing out there, and I think that's the frustration of, of consumers, frustration of providers, and I think OTC, though it was difficult in the beginning, came along at the right time to set clear boundaries of demarcation between PSAPs, what an OTC hearing aid is, what a you know cochlear implant is, what a prescription hearing aid is, and and really strong guidelines for manufacturers like us to to follow. Um, and, and for the FDA to regulate it. I think that that's super important. And I think uh, right now it's a little bit of the Wild West out there. And I think some of these direct-to-consumer companies are making claims that, you know, perhaps are unfounded. So um, if we have, a, again, a clear set of rules from the FDA and clear boundaries that we all can play within, I think that ultimately benefits the, the consumers, the providers, and uh, gets more people involved in their hearing health. And Chris probably can talk a little bit more to the features and benefits of, of what's out there, but um, you know, I, what differentiates the Sancho from anything else out there, in our opinion, is is our, our hearing test. And I, I think that's a really nice line of demarcation. Now, getting that across to providers and to consumers is a different story, and we're working on that. Um, but I, I, it's it's fun to have a technology that you believe in and that can help people. And, and, and the fact that we're partnering again with the audiology community to, to bring more people in the pipeline is, is fun and exciting. Yeah, uh, I would say um, one of the issues with uh, direct consumer hearing aids now is that while a lot of these devices are, are low cost, um, a lot of them are, are low quality. Um, and, and not only that, they're low customization, right? So um, many there are many products that are so-called 
pick and click de- uh, pick and click devices, which have a small number of amplification profiles to choose from, and you better hope your hearing matches one of those. Otherwise, you're out of luck. Um, some products allow the user to change the amplification directly themselves, which is certainly an interesting approach. Uh, we really believe that the best place to start is the hearing threshold curve. Um, after all, there's been a hundred years of audiology hearing research that's gone into translating that measure into uh, amplification parameters that uh, maximize audibility and speech intelligibility. So it seems unwise to throw that away just because a product is DTC. Well, it's uh, uh, it really is uh, a innovation. And I think right now uh, the way the way the uh, some of the other products in the marketplace have gone, your instrument is one of the one of the few left that's a true uh, patient uh, interactive kind of device for programming and some of those things. If I if I remember correctly, yeah, and that's all made possible through our app, our Autotune app, which um, is available on iOS or Android. It allows users to connect their hearing aids to their smartphone. Uh, They can do things like change the volume, mode, adjust the equalizer, noise reduction, and, uh, of course, uh, administer the the intelligent uh, hearing test that I I described earlier. Well, well, uh, you know, again, as a person who encourages colleagues in their clinics to have uh, to to investigate all of the uh, available OTC products that would be out there, I think that this is one that actually deserves their, their, their attention to at least for investigation to see what's going on. So, so Tony, if, uh, if a audiologist or a hearing aid dispenser are interested in, in, in using your products in their clinic, how do they go about uh, getting in touch with you guys? So they can go to our website at hearsoundwave.com. There's a professional tab and they can sign up and create a wholesale account. We'll enter in their wholesale pricing. The MSRP for our products are uh, $9.99 per set. They come in uh, two colors currently, gray and beige. Um, the, the audiologist can, can make um, 30, 35% on uh, at margin on, on the product. Um, if they want to uh, have a further conversation with me, I, I love these kinds of conversations. They can leave an email at uh, support at hearsoundwave.com. That email is found at the bottom of our website. And uh, fill in, fill in the, their, their name and information, and I'll, I'll contact them, and, and uh, we'll set up a call to discuss further and how uh, Soundwave wants to partner with the audiology community. Well, this has been an interesting discussion uh, from an innovative OTC product And I would encourage colleagues to begin to at least investigate the Santro device for possible use in their clinic with their patients. And I wanna thank uh, Tony Tony and uh, Chris for being with us today here at This Week in Hearing.